Anyway, as Shane had just demonstrated, um, you, know, you have both uh, a tragedy here, um, but also an inspirational story. Um, a family that can interact like that after uh, an event, you can't convey any other way. Um, Diane would make a superb witness. You can just feel the love coming from her. But when you match it with that video presentation, you can know what their life's about. And at trial, that's what you're trying to convey. And I'm sure, and the you know, defense counsel denied that that film played a role in settlement. I'm sure the issues weren't on damages, they're probably on liability. Um, but, you know, the day in the life films can be used uh, for settlement as well as at trial, and they can be used for establishing uh, what I'm going to be talking about, which are uh, video settlement brochures. These are basically short documentary films, anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes which encapsulate a case and are intended, although the, the components are going to be, you know, a lot of them will be admissible at trial, the intended focus of this is to make a presentation in order to get the case resolved as early as possible and then obviously for your client's benefit, uh, fairly resolved in their favor. Uh, I just finished one on Monday. As a matter of fact, I, uh, if anyone wants to stay around, uh, during lunch hour, I can show it. I can't show it on a public display, uh, but a uh, little uh, uh, short video, 22 minutes long, uh, for a young woman who had her arm uh, baked off in a commercial ironer where she was trapped inside it for 45 minutes. Um, and you can convey that entire case and what happened to her in 22 minutes. And what you have here is the power of then, you know, you put it on, this is that brochure. And there were copies that went out to every defense counsel, to the insurance adjusters, to the excess insurance adjusters, uh, to the principals of the defendants, because uh, there's a good chance that there will be an excess verdict in this matter. Um, and it, what it does is it takes uh, your case, it takes your client's voice, and it brings it right onto the desk or into the conference room of those who are evaluating the case and deciding the case. And the power of that is just tremendous. Um, I have been making um, some brochures since uh, Professor Austin uh, asked me last night about it. Since 1986, I've probably made between 50 and 75 over that time. And I can just tell you, um, there are now very much more. When I did it, we had you know, analog tapes. And if you changed minute uh, two of the tape in a half hour tape, you had to redo the entire thing. Uh, now with digital technology, we can, you know, it's like doing word processing. You know, I want to knock out a sentence. I just knock it out and, you know, ripple delete and it all merges back together and I put in a little cross dissolve, which is what we saw in the opening montage of photographs here, and it looks great. Uh, very easy to do. And what it does is it forces you, it forces the advocate to crystallize their case early on uh, worry about getting sure that, you know, computer animations, accident reconstructions, uh, the foundations for them are laid early in the case. It gets you to develop the themes, and then it gets it right out there. And besides that, they're, they're actually, for me, um, they're, they're a whole lot of fun. Um, I never <coughs> thought when I went to law school that I would be uh, worrying about uh, uh, shot setting, about uh, how to do an animation, how something looks visually. Um, but you, when you get into this, you get immersed in it, and, and you know, Professor Austin has really led the field in, in to bringing this to the fore. Um, it's just a lot of fun, and you get the, the power that you get is just tremendous. Uh, let me just show you. This is a Joe in this little clip, which is part of a, uh, of a longer settlement brochure. Joe was a uh, distinguished. Uh, Navy veteran and found himself on the path of traveling through the ground of 69,000 volts. And because the human body is more conductive uh, than sandy soil, the electricity ran up through one of his legs, down through another of his legs, uh, and caused severe burn injuries. Uh, he was one of five people who were in the path of this electricity, two of them who died. Um, and you can talk about Joe being a um, a stalwart guy, of being a fighter, but then when you look, and this is Joe at a PT session. Ready? Yeah. One, 
to therapist to come in and say Joe's a fighter. It's just not the same. It's the same way we saw Diane in PT. Um, and that brings it home. And, and it's sort of, you know, the power of that, um, which is part of a larger summer for sure, I mean, it's sort of fitting that we're in Guinness Hall because uh, Howard Guinness, um, who, after whom this hall is named, was a close friend of the founder of my firm, Art Reigns. And Art Reigns loved video. And he used to, every time Howard would come down from New York City, Arthur would grab him and drag him in and show him uh, uh, what he was working on, show him the video he was on, and wanted to try to see if he could scare the pants off Howard Gibb as he knew that he was doing the right job. Um, and that's, you know, that's what you're trying to do here. So where do you get the components for these? Um, with Joe, with clients who, I, a lot of my clients are burn survivors, um, we document all the way along. Um, we go out and videotape beginning from the earliest days, and go back on a regular basis and pick up snippets. Uh, this is... Does your firm have a full-time videographer? Well, we do have a full-time videographer, and we have um, a, um, an in-house video editing suite. Um, uh, and they occasionally let me play on it, only after they've saved everything else. Um, <laughs> and uh, I guess I was going to cover this later. The video editing suite, the computer, hardware for it, $11,000. Um, software, we use Adobe um, because we're on a, a PC-based rather than a Mac-based system. Um, a few thousand dollars, initial investment. And the uh, some brochure that I did for the young woman who had her arm baked off, the editing for that took three days. Uh, and it's all on site. So you know, I can run in from doing something else work on it, leave, come back again, and it's fabulous, it's fabulous and it's fabulously easy. Um, this is one side, right? This can show the power of early uh, doc, you know, preserving the earliest stages. This is a young boy, Abraham, uh, who was burned uh, when a stove tipped over. Stove tip over was a tremendous hazard. Uh, throughout the country, but also in Philadelphia, the fire department rescue personnel who responded to Abraham's. This was his seventh stove tip-over accident involving a child. Uh, you can just, with a few pounds of force, tip over a stove because of the way that they're designed. The outdoor oven works as a fulcrum. And kids and then elderly are burned between 20 to 40 deaths a year uh, related to stove tip-overs. It's a tremendous public policy problem. And here's Abraham just as he comes back from the burn unit. The company who made that stove and sold it violated industry standards, and then to cover it up, the corporate designee perjured himself. We caught him in the perjury, and we played for you a shortened version for the defendants when we were in the mediation and also as a subtle brochure, a full minute and a half. Uh, it was at that, this case was settled uh, through Ed Edelstein's office, and uh, I can tell you at the end of that minute and a half, there wasn't one of the corporate representatives who wasn't doing anything but looking at his toes. Um, the power of that, and you get that only if you get out there and you start preserving the evidence as soon as you possibly can. In addition to getting early footage of the victim, capture news footage. Um, 
I'm on Monday. My job is to start working on a settlement brochure uh, for a, uh, a gentleman up in Bridesburg uh, who was crushed to death in a, uh, a small front end load. <coughs> and that video is going to begin with the Channel 3 helicopter news coverage that's titled, you know, Tragedy in Bridesburg. And they have an overhead shot, they zoom in on the accident, and we've got uh, the uh, professional voiceover of the newscaster say, describing what happened. What a way to begin a video. Um, and that's, we just, act, if you're retained early in a case, there's a lot of services which will hold all news coverage for 30 days. You buy the story off of them, or um, I've developed rapport with some of the folks at Channel 3. They'll give me their news footage uh, that they have of the accident scene. And what a great way to start off a video presentation. At the same time you're gathering, you're creating this uh, material, you also want to be gathering in um, from the clients uh, fire uh, photographs and videos. You know, we met um, Diane, and we met Erica, with that first opening montage of photographs, we saw what she was like beforehand. Um, the plaintiffs in, that, in the matter where I'm representing them, where that woman's arm, right arm was burned off, you meet them with wedding footage and a voiceover of the husband talking about what their dreams were when they got married a year before the accident. And we have her throwing her bouquet with her right arm, and we cut from that to her with no right arm. Um, you know, a nice juxtaposition to, to make it clear to the defendants what this family has lost. So while you're, you have news footage, you can document, and also just gather what the clients have with them and bring it in to start organizing and start presenting it. You can interview witnesses. Um, and this is a delicate subject because if you do a video interview of a witness in a lot of forums, uh, you're gonna, that will be discoverable. Um, and so the way I do it, go out and you meet with the witness, you talk with them, you get what you want to have covered on video, you break it down into small paragraphs. You turn on the video camera, you have them talk for a paragraph, you stop. Talk some more, do another paragraph. And you do it both so that you don't record something that you're not intending to, but also so that you have paragraphs that you can then mix and match throughout the video as you need the story to unfold. Uh, for that young woman who was trapped inside the ironer, the police officer had to hold her up so she wouldn't literally rip her arm off. And he describes what it was like to hold her up, lean over the ironer, and smell her burnt flesh. Now, if you have that statement, you know, it just, you know, not only have the visual medium of this man and, and the police officer is, is clearly distressed at recalling the memory, but then you add another sense. Um, he can hear her screaming. He can see it. He can see the smoke rising out of it. And he can smell it. And when you've got that sort of presentation of what took place at the time of the accident, that really brings it home. Then you also can gather material at depositions. Um, almost all of uh, the depositions that I take, I videotape because the times that I don't videotape the deposition, is when somebody says something really good. Um, and uh, you know, I'm not as smooth as Shane Inspector in terms of how I ask questions, but nuggets fall out um, every so often. This is, I'm going to show you a clip. This is a corporate vice president who was approached by his staff and said, your practice here is going to cause a ground of electricity to go through and 69,000 volts will be released in an area where you know people are going to be. And his response was, F you. Um, I don't care. Let's go ahead. And we had this corroborated by co-witnesses. So this guy made the decision for 560 bucks for an event where they make $9 million. He decided to go ahead uh, and let people be at risk. And as I mentioned, two people died. Two gentlemen, all these are decorated uh, Navy veterans. Two lost both their legs. And a woman was uh, horribly burned. And here's his and I'm not doing, I'm at the beginning of the deposition. I'm just, you know, trying to get a feel, see what phrasing he's going to have, see where I can move towards. And I'm just saying, so, where, where did you hear about the accident? Overdown's vice president and general manager, Jerry Dunning, with attorney Brigham. When did you first hear about this accident? Uh, 
I believe it was around 2 a.m. the morning following the accident. And where were you first told? What was I first told? Yep. That some people had erected a flagpole and came in contact with the power line and there was a fatality. When you heard that news, do you recall what your reaction was? Oh, shit. What did you do next? Um, sat for a few minutes and collected my thoughts and, and uh, I got told my wife what, uh, what I just heard. And, and uh, we ended up back to sleep in about 15 minutes probably or so. He rolled over and went to sleep, okay? The defense attorney, really wonderful defense attorney, excellent guy, said when those words came out of this guy's mouth, he knew what was going to be played in the opening, and he said that the blood drained out of his head and he had to keep his head from falling forward. Because <laughs> roll over and go to bed? And, and not... That was a great question on my part. You know, I sort of fumbled it out, but you never know what you're going to stumble across. Um, and to capture moments like that is, is literally worth here a pot of gold uh, for these families. Uh, so I take uh, the depositions as, and videotape as much as any case can afford. They're expensive to do. Um, they can be a little bit cumbersome. Sometimes you get defendants object, but I'll tell you, they, they are gold. Uh, in this a uh, case where the young woman with the arm uh, was trapped. It's a commercial flatwork ironer. There are screens along the front which are supposed to prevent anybody from getting inside of there. Uh, the defendant hid for four years a third-party videotape which showed the ironer at their facility with the guards removed, at least the guards in part removed. Two of the four screens were removed. Uh, and the question that the whole lawsuit's about where did the guards come off? And we have it at the defendant's facility with the guards off. And I'm asking their chief engineer, you know, that one of the screens looks a little askew, and what does that mean? Yeah, it looks like it's recessed back. Yeah. Do, do you know if this one was falling off? I don't know. Okay. Um, I honestly don't believe we'd let it run if it was falling off because it has a chance of then falling into the roller and causing damage to the iron. Okay, so you wouldn't let a condition exist where you might damage the iron. Right. I mean, but you would let your workers operate in front of a piece of equipment with a missing screen? At that point, I'd have to say that's what we did. Yeah. Sometimes people just stumble right into it. Um, so videotape depositions to per part of a, of a presentation. And there are other ways, the format that I, oh wait till, the format that I normally use is a very quick introduction of the accident and the parties. And then liability, why I think that these companies uh, should be held responsible, and then the damages portion. Um, and so explaining the story, what happened, sometimes uh, is crucial to the case and can be very difficult. And there are easy ways oftentimes to do it. Uh, in Abraham's case, the defendant's big argument was that the splash pattern of burns weren't consistent with the stove tip over. That they thought he must have climbed up on the stove and pulled over a pot of water onto him and that it couldn't have happened that way. So being a high rolling you know, uh, outfit that we are, we buy a $100 stove, a $50 mannequin, and we go to Target and we get some pants and shorts for the mannequin that's the same size as Abraham. And so for $160, $65, we do a, uh, an accident recreation. This demonstration shows what happened on February 28, 1999. The stove tipped over spilling a pot of scalding water onto Abraham. 165 bucks. And that, his pants matched exactly where they got splashed there, the splash pattern of his burn injuries. For 165 bucks, worth it? Told the story. It demonstrated. 
um, and laying it out. Um, and actually, we'll talk. I'll talk a little bit at the end. That little vignette has now appeared twice on uh, public service pieces, alerting people to the hazard of stove tip overs, which, you know, as uh, Professor Austin said at the beginning, uh, those of us who are tort lawyers view a lot of what we do as social policy. Uh, we always want to have, as part of each case that we, uh, for our clients, that we, something changes in the conduct of the defendant and the design of the product so that it won't happen again. Um, and that is a big driving force behind uh, attorneys who represent uh, victims of either professional negligence or corporate wrongdoing. That's, you know, that's one of the reasons why we're in this business. As a matter of fact, my settlement brochures have been used as training films um, by defendants. Uh, this is what happens when you mess up. Um, very simple there, very inexpensive. Um, uh, Professor Lawson wanted me, you know, so there's a spectrum of budgets here for people to uh, uh, to make these on, uh, for 165 bucks you have that. This next one is in a case where David was working next to a 10 foot tall, 11 foot wide uh, pressurized vessel with superheated steam inside of it, and it ruptured, burned him over 99% of his body. He lived for six weeks and then died. Um, and the, it ruptured. We argued because it wasn't provided with a proper pressure relief valve. The defense was that it ruptured because it was David's own gosh darn fault, um, and because he reversed step 13 and 14 in the procedure to uh, clean out this tank, to backwash this tank. So that's their defense. He reversed 13 to 14. That sounds a little silly, but what's a good way to demonstrate that? This is a in-house PowerPoint presentation created for under 200 bucks. Uh, the voiceover was, uh, and all of the, uh, the presentations that I made does not have my voice on it. Uh, uh, it's got a, a, a professional announcer. This is uh, uh, Mel Alper uh, who did it, and uh, Mel was a professional radio announcer here for a long time, did a lot of cases uh, with us. Um, he was a chemical engineer too, so he'd always criticize my terminology. Uh, he's since retired. We, we, there are lots of excellent people around. But here is just responding to the defendants. He should have just followed the instructions. For each backwashing, the Cochrane manual directs the operator to close valve M, close valve E, Open valve G, open valve W, open valve B, open valve A, close valve G, close valve B, close valve W, open valve M, open valve R, adjust valve H to the proper pressure, close valve R, Open valve E. All right, perfectly clear, right? <laughs> now, that's their defense, is that he got step 13 or 14 reversed, and so it's his own fault, and that's why he got burned to death. Um, and, you know, we had Mel put a little, you know, urgency in his voice, you know, try a little bit of breathiness in there to add to it, um, and, you know, obviously, back, I mean, just a lot of the injuries and... <laughs> All sorts of other stuff in that case is resolved quickly. On the more sophisticated end, so that one's under 200 bucks. Um, this is uh, a uh, two electricians were sent in to what they were told and what was tested in front of them as being a de-energized uh, electrical switch gear. Uh, it's where you channel within a plant uh, energy uh, with uh, 12,000 volts inside of it, and to explain where the fuses were and where the access points were and what the interlock system was, uh, we made up a video. This is a portion of that video. Um, and First key in the system, which is used to unlock the selector switch. Now, the handle can be moved to the open position, de-energizing the fuses. Only then, can the second key at the top of the switch
be freed to unlock the fuse compartment door. However, ITE's system was ineffective and easy to bypass because even without using either Kirk key, the bottom panels could be easily removed, allowing access to the bottom of the energized fuses. For safety, ITE should have provided an insulating barrier below the fuses to fully isolate this dangerous area. And it goes on. But you can see it's clear, the terminology's there, and we, that animation was reviewed by our experts beforehand, laid the foundation so if we had a minute at the time of trial, we could do so. Uh, and, and it's a great aid for explaining to the jury both um, the design alternative as well as why the accident happened. Um, that animation uh, was done by Center City Video, about $15,000 for that. And it's a much longer piece because um, we had two defendants in the case, the property owner uh, who did the um, uh, lockout tagout procedures negligently and the designer. Um, and we crafted two cases because we knew we were going to settle with one of them and then wanted to try the case against the, or threaten the trial case against the non-settling defendant. And so there were different settlement brochures for each, different animations for each. Uh, but even with that, uh, that came in at right around $15,000. Uh, higher end budget than if you're a public interest lawyer, but still certainly within what, I mean, in this case, resolved for a significant sum for the, for the clients. So how do you do these? I mean, the key thing is organization. You've got to have uh, a concept inside your head of what the themes are going to be, what you need to develop, uh, how are you going to portray the plaintiffs, and then you take that and you sort out uh, I'll have an interview of a family member uh, for Manuela Carrion, who's the uh, uh, woman who had her arm in the ironer. About a 45 minute interview. We transcribe that. We time code a copy of it. We pick out the, from the transcription what we want to have. We cut it down based on the time code. We pull up those pieces on the computer. We refine it further. And then we just show it to a test audience. You know, what do you think about here? You know, the first video I did with a widow, um, she had red nail polish on. And I showed it in the office, and the women said to me, Ooh, red nail polish, you know, harlot. Um, and, you know, I, you, you know, you learn. You learn. Um, no red nail polish for widows. Um, how people are dressed, how they look, what's the backdrop. First expert witness I did had a potted plant coming out of the top of his head. Uh, these are all things you learn you know, early in, in the process. Uh, if you're doing videotape subtle brochures, you want to, or just be videotape uh, depositions for trial, same concerns. Uh, you want to know, it's got to make it visually pleasing to have it happen. Do the cut downs, show them to um, uh, a test audience. Uh, I uh, do a lot of uh, mock jury assessments of cases and uh, key portions of the case that I want to get a jury's response to is usually excerpts from uh, the videotape settlement brochure, the animation, is it clear, how does it come across, how does the defendants come across, how do the plaintiffs come across, and get a sense of valuation of the case. Uh, there's great resources in Philadelphia for doing mock juries uh, through uh, uh, Ed's firm, maybe our options, they do it. Uh, there's focus groups in town which can do it to you. And relatively low budget uh, for what uh, you get on the return. After you get all this together, you do the cut downs. You, you know, we have an in-house, uh, the Adobe suite, because we're not Mac uh, savvy there. Um, and we'll hear all the criticism of not using a Mac system. But the, uh, it's very easy to do. Then we go get a voiceover professionally recorded, lay it down, send it out. Um, and we always accompany this with, you know, we produce these at the same time we produce our expert reports. Um, in a cover letter outlining liability and can get it out to the defendants. Uh, how much do they normally range from? Not counting expert fees, because you go over to a doctor's office and you ask them to explain, you know, what happened here, what's it like, you know, is the person going to be able to function with the prosthesis, um, what was the surgery, uh, you know, in almost any trauma room now, uh, the, the trauma surgeons are documenting the condition of the patient as they come in. And so you gather those photographs. Uh, all those expert fees aside, uh, you can put together a video selling brochure for 
between $5,000 and $50,000. That's the budget that we generally operate from. Uh, a lot of it's done, we do it in-house. Uh, you know, like most trial attorneys, we're fairly control uh, freaks and oriented. And so, you know, I like to know, I know what, how I want these people to come across, and, and I know how to, uh, I'd like to see it come out. And then you get it done. Um, and it really, I can tell you the power of it is just tremendous. It really is. Uh, and once that case is to bat, um, it, it's not over uh, for some of the material that you develop there. Uh, you know, the stock footage I have of a dermatome, which is like a little cheese slicer you use to peel off skin to graft, that's been a lot of videos. Uh, but even more importantly, it is you can use this for public advocacy. Um, uh, I, with one of my partners, Roy DeCaro, represented a woman uh, who was severely burned in a propane gas grill, grill explosion. Uh, her mom was fatally uh, burned. And the, well, the gas tank uh, lacked a safety feature on the valve itself, a safety feature which the defendants fought being mandated for 10 years and had been banned for a number of years, and the, uh, the local propane dealer still continued to fill the tanks. That case resolved, again, through uh, ADR options. And um, uh, afterwards, we were still concerned about this, and we worked with Channel 3 uh, to do a short piece on propane gas grill safety. This is just a little vignette from that. This is um, our client, uh, Marion Johnson, uh, and we provided to the eyewitness team a defective tank with a defective valve. Um, and uh, you're not supposed to be able to fill these in Philadelphia. Remember, it's illegal to fill these in Philadelphia anymore. And we said, if you go to any one of these three places, they've always filled them for us before uh, illegally. And they went out there with a the camera crew, of course, and, uh, and uh, found out that we were right, uh, unfortunately. PA in Delaware, its recommended propane filling stations don't refill tanks which lack the anti-leaking safety device. In New Jersey, the state enforces that. And it's the last line of defense to prevent a disaster. The Philadelphia Fire Department hopes that the dealers of propane would come down on the side of safety uh, in regards to filling the older tanks. But as we found out when we went undercover in Northeast Philly, some places still fill the tanks anyway. Ultimately, the propane tank manufacturers could have fixed this problem years ago by adding a new part that costs little more than pocket change. A devastating reality for Marion Johnson. So you look at it, that was your mom, $2. She died for $2. Part of a larger piece that was on the news, we got a lot of positive responses to, uh, and turning in a lot of tanks. Uh, that didn't have the proper safety feature on it, a, a, a uh, overfill protection device. So, uh, I'll be glad to uh, answer questions after uh, Ed speaks, uh, and also I'll stay, and if anybody wants to watch uh, more segments, I just don't want to take the time now to compose of the video I just finished this week, do that uh, with the caveat that you do see the, what the arm looks like after it's been uh, baked for 45 minutes, so it's, it's not compatible with an easy lunch. Um, so, thanks very much.